Professor Dave and Chegg here, we now know quite a bit about atoms, their electron configurations, and other related concepts. So we are ready to visually depict groups of atoms in order to find out how they will bond to one another to form compounds. The convention we will use is that of Lewis symbols, or Lewis dot structures. A Lewis symbol will refer to an individual atom, so let's learn how to draw these first before drawing complete structures. A Lewis symbol will consist of an element's chemical symbol surrounded by some dots. These dots are the valence electrons of that atom. When we place these dots, we typically will use four coordination sites, or basically the areas to the top, bottom, left, and right of the chemical symbol. And we will place one electron in each location before doubling them up, sort of like Hund's rule. For example, these are the Lewis symbols for the elements in period three of the periodic table. You can see how the dots are distributed as we go from one to eight valence electrons, and we can see that up through silicon, each electron is alone. And then from phosphorus to argon, we begin placing a second electron in each coordination site. If we want to draw Lewis symbols for cations and anions, it's really no different. For a cation, we simply remove a particular number of dots and display the corresponding charge. For anions, we add dots and display the charge. These individual Lewis symbols are what we combine in order to show a Lewis dot structure for a compound. If that compound is ionic, we simply place the Lewis structures of the ions next to each other, such as with sodium chloride here. But Lewis dot structures are much more useful in the context of covalent compounds. If we want to use Lewis symbols to represent all the atoms in a covalent compound, we have to show the manner in which the electrons are shared between the atoms. To do this, we simply need to draw the Lewis symbols for each atom in the compound, and then wherever there are unpaired electrons, atoms can come together to form a covalent bond, as a covalent bond involves one electron from each of two atoms being shared between them. For example, here are two chlorine atoms, each with seven valence electrons, one of which is unpaired. The two atoms come together to form a covalent bond consisting of the unpaired electrons. In Lewis dot structures, instead of two electrons sitting between two atoms, covalent bonds will be represented by a line. So always remember that any line in a Lewis dot structure represents two electrons. And we can also have lone pairs, which are pairs of electrons that are not participating in any bonds. Each chlorine atom has three lone pairs here. Here are a few more examples of covalent compounds represented as Lewis dot structures. Notice that each pair of electrons in a covalent bond is expressed as a line, while lone pairs remain individual dots. Now let's go over some guidelines. The first of these is called the octet rule. This is the rule that states that certain elements, especially some of the most common ones, like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, will form bonds in such a way so as to become surrounded by eight electrons, be they from covalent bonds or lone pairs. This is a condition called a full octet, and it is like achieving a full valence shell, or noble gas electron configuration. For example, carbon has four valence electrons, so it will tend to make four bonds in order to interact with four more electrons and fill its octet. Each covalent bond has two electrons in it, so carbon is surrounded by eight electrons. Nitrogen, with one lone pair and three electrons, will only need three bonds to fill its octet, since one of its coordination sites already has a pair of electrons. Three bonds plus the two electrons in the lone pair equals eight. Oxygen, with two lone pairs and two electrons, will need two bonds to fill its octet. And fluorine will need only one more electron and thus one covalent bond to fill its octet. Noble gases like neon already have a full octet because they have a full valence shell, which is why they don't make covalent bonds. So these few elements we just mentioned will tend to follow the octet rule, and this will be a good guideline when considering these elements. Later we will see that most other elements will not follow the octet rule, like the way that hydrogen only needs two electrons to be satisfied, or how elements with access to d orbitals can expand their octets and accommodate more bonds than would be expected. But elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are the most commonly found in organic molecules apart from hydrogen, so the octet rule applies to a lot of molecules. A result of the octet rule when looking at carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen is that these atoms can make more than one bond to one another if they need to in order to fill their octet. 
Take, for example, carbon dioxide. If we place the oxygens on either side of the carbon atom, we can see that joining unpaired electrons to form the two bonds will leave some more unpaired electrons. Therefore, we can make additional bonds between these atoms, forming double bonds between the carbon and the two oxygens. Formaldehyde and ethylene are further examples of double bonds. The only way to complete an octet for each atom is for them to share four electrons. We can see that if each bond counts as two electrons towards the octet of any atom participating in the bond, then all of these atoms will each have an octet. We can also have triple bonds, such as with these molecules. As we mentioned, there are many situations in which the octet rule is not followed. There are some electron-deficient molecules that lack an octet for the central atom. Elements like boron and aluminum only have three valence electrons, so they can only make three covalent bonds. In boron trifluoride, boron makes three bonds to fluorine, so it will have only six electrons around it rather than eight. This is a violation of the octet rule. In addition, while elements that follow the octet rule will be tetravalent, meaning they will have four coordination sites, there are also hypervalent elements like phosphorus and sulfur. These can have five or six bonds respectively, which exceed the octet rule in terms of the number of electrons that can be found around a central atom. This happens because these elements have access to d orbitals, whereas elements in period 2 like carbon and oxygen do not. So these elements will commonly make 5 and 6 covalent bonds respectively. Even xenon, a noble gas, which we would expect to be inert, actually can make covalent bonds with select other elements, such as with the compounds shown here. So we should get used to the idea that the octet rule really only applies to a handful of elements on the table. We should now be able to draw Lewis structures for simple molecules. This is absolutely crucial, as it is how we will be depicting molecules from now on. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.